Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, we wanted to start on time. Um, no one yelled back for once. That's good. Um, we're glad you braved the, uh, the sudden winter to join us at Roosevelt House. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of the house. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, who has built, well, rebuilt this house. I call it the house that Sarah Delano Roosevelt built and Jennifer Rabb rebuilt. And that's why we're here, and that's why these programs have been taking place for 10 years. Um, and I will say that for the rest of this semester to every group that arrives. Um, I want to welcome you all, and uh, particularly um, uh, acknowledge Daniel Shuckman, our uh, esteemed advisory board member who has uh, made possible the reception that you're all invited to following this event uh, to join us in a toast to our special guest about whom I'll tell you in a moment and of course to get online or in line or just get up there and buy a book which he will be happy to sign. So welcome to this program. Uh, Richard Horowitz is here. He's the author of In the Garden of the Righteous the heroes who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. Um, and um, uh, we like to pay attention to that theme here. Uh, it's part, in a way, of the Roosevelt legacy, and we've explored it here, whether it was for the new Ken Burns uh, uh, film, America and the Holocaust, or for previous books. And we will continue, uh, thanks to our wonderful Leah Garrett of the Jewish Studies Center and other faculty and center leaders on campus to make this a centerpiece of our explorations here. Um, Richard is a, a writer, investor, and founder and publisher of the Octavian Report, a magazine of ideas. His writing has appeared widely in the Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Times of London, the Los Angeles Times. Your time is everywhere, is our time. Um, <laughs> Time Magazine, but also, thank goodness, the Boston Globe, so I could get out the Time thing, and the Jerusalem Post, among many other publications. Um, he was uh, educated at Yale, where he received his undergraduate degree in history, magna cum laude, and uh, Phi Beta Kappa, and received his uh, uh, training, uh, his law degree from Columbia Law School, where he was a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar. Uh, he's a New Yorker, and um, where I think this may be his first visit to Roosevelt House, particularly as a speaker, and we're really delighted to have him. Leah Garrett is the inaugural director and the ongoing inaugural director of Hunter College's Jewish Studies Center and director of Hunter's um, Hebrew and Jewish Studies program. Um, she is the author of a book we celebrated here, a wonderful book called X Troop, the Secret Jewish Commandos of, uh, of World War II, and also Young Lions, How Jewish Authors Reinvented the American War Novel, which was a, a prize-winning book and a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. She's also a, an extraordinary program moderator, so what a team and what a pleasure it is to invite Richard Horowitz and Leah Garrett to our stage. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really nice to see such a good crowd because um, it's been a while since we've been able to do these types of events. So it's wonderful we're all here tonight. And we also have a really strong amount of people attending on Zoom. So hello, uh, Zoom audiences um, as well. And, and what we're going to discuss tonight is particularly important right now as we're dealing with this seemingly endless and horrendous rise in anti-Semitism. Um, so I'm really honored that I get to be in conversation with Richard tonight. The way it's gonna work is I'm gonna ask him a series of questions and we're gonna have a discussion for about half an hour or so and then we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions. So as we're talking, think about things you may want to ask of Richard. Um, and I'm gonna start broadly and then get into more specific questions. So I, I know that many of you will purchase the book tonight. You may not have seen it um, yet. So if we can start by just having you generally discuss what your book is about. Sure. Um... And I, I did want to um, thank uh, Roosevelt House for, for having me and all of you for, for coming out and Daniel for, for your support and Harold for hosting us and Leah, of course, for 
being in conversation. Um, so the book, um, which is called In the Garden of the Righteous, is actually named after a real place that many of you may be familiar with at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Um, and it's a, it's a place where um, when they honor somebody who um, rescued Jews, and there's very stringent criteria, and so it's, uh, you can't be Jewish, um, you had to have risked your life, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, they plant a tree, and, um, and that tree is now turned into a forest because there are um, 29, almost 28,000 people who've been so recognized. Now, I say that sounds like a big number, but you have to contextualize it that there were 500 million people who lived in Europe at the time. So one, one way I think we're probably all New Yorkers here, so I'll use a New York example. If you filled Madison Square Garden with a representative um, you know, sample of the population of Europe at the time, you'd have one, one righteous person. So that was extremely, extremely rare. Um, and it's something I've been interested in um, since college, really, when the Holocaust Museum opened in, um, in Washington. And I, I went through the exhibit the way a lot of American Jews do, and it was very upsetting to me. I remember seeing this very big pile of shoes of concentration camp um, you know, victims, many of them children. And I, I mention that because it's actually, as I've been talking about the book, everyone seems to be, that seems to be the image that almost everyone remembers. And I remember coming out, and they had a small exhibit around people who had tried to help. And I learned about a group called the White Rose, who were um, German students uh, who tried to foment an uprising. They're actually the... Um, among the first people to also publicize the Holocaust because they issued these leaflets. And, um, and it, it always stayed with me. And then I wrote an article um, for the New York Times on the 75th anniversary of their execution because they were you know, caught and um, summarily executed by the Nazis. And, um, and the article had a huge reaction, um, went completely viral. And you know, when you write an article like this, you like scour the internet, which is a very scary place for stuff. And there wasn't one negative. I mean, I've had other. I, you know, you write on about finance, and they you get the Nazi stuff, but not on not on this. So I started writing these articles because I always found them interesting. You know, really inspiring. And I found a lot of people did. So I turned it into the book. And the other thing is, you know, which we can talk about further because there are reasons for this. But other than you know, everyone of a certain age knew Wallenberg, and then after 1994, everyone knew Schindler, and maybe some people know the Danish story. But um, once you get past that, you know, these stories are virtually unknown. I, I opened the book with a chapter one as a Portuguese diplomat who saved, they th it was the single largest rescuer during the Holocaust. He probably saved as many as 30,000 people, Aristides de Souza Mendes, and it was everybody from the Rothschilds uh, to just very poor Jews to the Habsburg family, and no one's heard of him. And people, have, everyone's heard of Heinrich Himmler. So I think there's like a historical injustice also that I wanted to correct, but mostly it was, it's about telling these amazing stories and um, what we can learn from them. Thank you, and actually when you mentioned Wallenberg, I, I should have said this at the start, but sort of the biggest supporter of the Center for Jewish Studies is a, a great woman named Eva Cooper who was one of the Wallenberg survivors. So, um, so us at Hunt, we at Hunter are particularly in gratitude uh, due to, to that story. Um, so before we get into sort of more of the specifics, something I have found audiences always like and authors never think to talk about is the research proce process. How did you find these stories? Where did you find these stories? How did you uncover them? How did you verify them? If you could talk about that and then we'll go into more specifics? Yeah, um, so I'm uh, very interested in research. I was trained at um, Yale as a, as a researcher, and then I went to Wall Street, and this gentleman in the front row taught me how to be even better researcher <laughs> than I work for. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, once I started getting involved with the stories, first of all, people started sending me stories, and there's a whole world of, a small world of people who are interested in, in, um, in rescue. Um, so I, I have many, 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 many more stories. Even my initial proposal would have been, was supposed to be 15 stories. It would have been a three, you know, 3,000 page book. No one would have read it. So there was, a, there was an issue, you know, part of the process was actually winnowing down 
the stories. Um, but I, I accessed archival research all over the world um, in over 12 languages. Um, Yad Vashem is an interesting archive because anytime anybody, not all of my rescuers got the righteous title, but if you do receive it, there's a very thick file with a lot of eyewitness testimony. Um, there, uh, you know, I looked at a lot of um, uh, video testimony, which is really important. Um, actually, Sophie Scholl of the White Rose, I, when I wrote the article, I got an email from someone at NYU um, who was her daughter who worked at NYU at the law school. She said, do you want to meet my mother? And I said, yes. So I ran over, and she was like 97 years old, and, um, and she'd never been videoed. And so I said, you have to video her. Um, and so those are really important. And then I, I did a lot of, um, as many interviews as I could. So I was able to interview a lot of, a lot of survivors, all, pretty much all of whom were children. Um, and then maybe the most fascinating part, which I think really gave the book a different dimension, was I was able to interview a lot of the children of the rescuers, including actually um, one I had interviewed, but she's contacted me through LinkedIn two days ago. She's 95. <laughs> she's read the book, and it was an amazing interview because she said to me, you know, like, in my parents' house, like, that wasn't the color of the carpet, <laughs> right? Like, she still rem had amazing recall. And, um, and um, that was really interesting also because, you know, it was a mixed bag. Right, so um, some people um, viewed their parent as like a saintly figure. Um, Hiram Bingham, who's an interesting kind of, given where we are now, he was a member of the State Department, worked for FDR. I interviewed three of his children. They, that's how they view him. Others, his partner in crime was Varian Fry. He spoke to his son. He said, "My father was completely bipolar and kind of abusive and like not nice." And and even the woman um, who with the the 95 year old, I mean, her parents were very important leaders in the nonviolent movement. They were the pastor and his wife in a town called Le Chambon in, in France. And uh, they saved about 5,000 people, 3,500 Jewish children. And they went out of their way to make it, you know, I spoke to some of the children that had been there. And it, for them, it was like they didn't even know the war was going on. They went to school. They had you know, all kinds of programming. And, but she said, and she loved her parents and thought they were amazing figures. She said, but you know, like, <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't come to our piano recital at school. Like, we've, we didn't expect them to, but, like, she was still upset about it, you know, years later. So, so as much eyewitness, you know, like, testimony as I could find, I, I did. But, but um, there's lots of information, information out there, um, and it's kind of, you know, buried all over the world. And so um, you, you spoke about this at the start, about the, your feeling that this is a story that has not been told enough, and why do you think... That's the case. Well, I think there. Okay, so I think there are a few reasons for that. Um, some have to do. So, I'll start just by saying that um, uh, there's there's reasons related to the rescuers, which I'll talk about in one second. The, the, there, there's an overarching issue, which was the the first generation, and I think this is, you know, I'm not going to. There's a fairness to this. Um, the first generation of people who survived um, the, the the Shoah. Many of them had been in camps, and so therefore many of them had not been rescued. And um, they felt um, that to focus on rescue, and I, we I mentioned earlier how rare it was, one out of 20,000 people recognized that Yad Vashem would distort the record. Um, so that was a little bit of it. Uh, uh, that's the part I kind of understand, even though Yad Vashem, when it was set up, one of its core missions from the beginning was to um, recognize people who did this, because it's a sort of fundamental Jewish value, it's a fundamental humanist and you know, value of gratitude and to, to, to do that. Um, so, so that was a little bit of it. I think there's also just the human nature aspect that people were really interested in evil. I mean, that's the problem we have. I mean, you watch the news, they never tell you anything good. And um, so, you know, there you had the Milgram experiments at Yale, you had the Stanford prison experiments, and you had a lot of the history that was written was about, you know, why did people do this? You had Eichmann in Jerusalem, very little on, on rescue. Um, but then you have the issue that most rescuers themselves didn't tell anybody what they did. They were extremely reticent. And that was, like, amazing to me as I went through probably thousands of stories. You would hear the same, almost the same words 
you know, I didn't do anything special. I why did people like I just did what anybody would do. I did the decent thing. So, and I don't think it was false modesty at all. And I mean, when you kind of think about like why people did this, you you realize that. So, so there was one. There was the issue that that the rescuers often didn't tell people what they did because they were modest. I think there was an element as well of trauma. A lot of these people risked their lives, and a lot of them had what we would call today post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. Um, then there was the issue that um, it was kind of not a great thing in the after the war to have been a rescuer because the war didn't end anti-Semitism. And so people came back. Uh, when people found out what happened, they would be irate with them. They would say, you know, why did you do this? Like, who likes the Jews? And like, you could have brought problems to our community. Um, so that was another big issue. I mean, Oscar Schindler had um, stones thrown at him in, in, in Germany after the war and actually ended up in litigation with a guy who kind of taunted him and said he was like a, a Jew lover and he hit him. And he ended up having to pay the guy a fine. And people real, I mean, his story is fascinating because he was beloved in Israel and then he would go back to Germany. He was kind of like hated. And then, and then there's a final like relevant because a lot of this happened obviously in Eastern Europe and after when the Cold War started, um, it was institutional anti-Semitism, you know, in behind the Iron Curtain, right? And if, if, if we didn't have the, the Nazis and fascism, like we would all be, we'd be talking about was how horrendous communism, I mean, it was horrendous and, it, and anti-Semitism was a big part of it. And so if you were a righteous, um, it was very dangerous. Um, you were, um, first of all, the, it, it was, you know, the anti-Semitism. Second of all, often you were viewed as somebody who was allied with the underground, which often meant you worked with the Western allies and therefore you were an anti-communist or at a minimum suspect. And so you had people um, who had the righteous medal in their drawer and kept it there until after the Berlin Wall fell. I have a chapter on a woman named Irena Sendler rescued 2,500 Jewish um, children, infants, toddlers, and adolescents. And in the early 60s, she was recognized. And the Polish government not only would not allow her to go get the medal, but they wouldn't let her children after once they found out they couldn't go to university. So people were really punished for doing this. So it was different forms of punishment. And, and that's the, you know, it come, in, in the book, you, you, if, if you read it, you'll see that a lot of the re rescuers actually paid a heavy price for, for what they did. That is incredibly interesting to me because I knew about it, but I did not know the extent about that. So can I just stay with that for one second because I find this so interesting. Were there any sort of post-war countries that seemed to appreciate the act of the rescuers better than others? Or was it sort of a general? Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, the further, I mean, it's amazing. Like Albania, which was a majority Muslim country, had a 100% survival rate. They were amazing. And then this small cadre of communists took over and they like killed the story for 50 years. Um, so, but the further west you went, yes, I think the British were very proud of the kinder transport. France is complicated because, you know, everyone was part of the resistance afterwards and, you know. Um, so places, what you ended up having obviously were, as time went on, I mean, you take Sousa Mendes, whose life was destroyed by Salazar, but who the Portuguese also later tried to take credit for being a ref, you know, a haven, and 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 so, um, you know, as time went on, these places have changed their view. So, we honored Sousa Mendes in the United States before Portugal did, but eventually, he they be, he became a um, he became a, a they re rehabilitated him. They made him an ambassador posthumously, and he's now a national hero. The the White Rose, there are more schools named after them. They're quite famous in Germany, right? I, I think Germany's actually been done a much better job of kind of reconciliation than a lot of the other countries, in, you know, that were um, implicated. Um, but they're, I mean, that's who they want, you know, to celebrate, right? So, um, you know, but I think, the, yeah, the Western countries came around, you know, but, but it was a while. I mean, even again, like Susan meant 30,000 people, you would think he would be, they'd be running to do that. But even in this country, I mean, Hiram Bingham, not to like criticize, FDR, I won't do that right now, but, 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 but you know, he was bounced out of the State Department and um, kind of had his life ruined. And he, um, 
he's not been recognized as righteous, um, and uh, he was this diplomat who gave a lot of visas to pretty much much of the intelligentsia of Europe, all the surrealists, uh, Hannah Arendt, Marcel Duchamp, um, Marc Chagall, and um, the State Department here still hasn't recognized him, and there's a bill going through Congress right now to recognize diplomats, and there's 60 of them, there's only one American, and it's him, and he kind of still hasn't been, even in our own country, somebody we should be really proud of. Um, so could you tell us um, a couple of the stories of the righteous that you think are just really impacted on you or you want to share with the audience um, before they read the book? Sure. Um, I mean, they're all, I try to pick 10 very different stories from each other to give very different reasons that people, um, that people did this. Um, so, I mean, the, people always ask me, like, who's your favorite, which is like asking you, like, who's your favorite child, which I have two, and they're both my favorite either. Um, but, I mean, one that, I, I mean, I love, Susan Mendez, the, the Portuguese diplomat, has been described in some of the reviews as sort of the breakout star of the book. I mean, another one to me that's just completely fascinating is Gino Bartoli, um, who won the Tour de France in 1938. He was one of the most famous athletes in Europe, um, at the I mean, people were cycling mad, right? And the, the Tour de France was the ultimate, and Italy in particular. And so he was this famous athlete. He was an anti-fascist. Mussolini really took sports seriously. So at that time, the Italians had they had won the World Cup um, and hosted it. Uh, Primo Carnera had dedicated the heavyweight championship to him. And when Bartoli won the um, the Tour de France, he refused to dedicate it to Mussolini. So there was he was already taking a stand. And um, then when the war happened, um, he, he had this, uh, um, well, first of all, he hid a family of four in his basement, Jews, um, and then another Jewish guy and a Roma um, in his bicycle shop. He could have been, I mean, if he was discovered, he would have been shot on the spot. And then he did this amazing thing where, um, you know, after 1943, so the thing about the Italians was, Wherever you were, if you were occupied in an Italian zone, they didn't do roundups. And so even though in Italy there was discrimination, they didn't round up and they certainly didn't deport the Jews. But after 1943, when we came up, the Allies kind of, the, 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 the war bogged down right below Rome. And so the Mussolini fell, the Germans came down, put him back on, but then they occupied the north. So if you were Jewish and you were anywhere north of Rome or north, you were in dire um, situation. And the church which is really complicated, right? Um, in the north, actually, there was a, a group called the Assisi Underground, um, which was the Cardinal of Florence and the um, Cardinal of Genova and the Archbishop of Assisi and some other officials. And they, they were hiding Jews and partisans in monasteries and convents and even in the cloisters. And Bartoli, because he was um, had an excuse to train, <laughs> and he because he could also ride for hundreds of miles physically, he was able to do that. He would go out in plain sight in his uniform with his name and, and he was biking all over north of Italy and in his bike he had false papers um, that he was bringing that were life-saving to people and so he was a courier for them and, uh, and there are great stories because he was like so famous. I mean, this was like if like LeBron James was doing something, right? Like, so they would stop him at the checkpoint and people would be like, yeah, Gino Bartoli and then they would want to talk about cycling and then he'd say, you know, don't touch my bike, it's perfectly calibrated. And you know, there's, he would show up at a train station, and they would everyone would you know start going crazy and giving him a cappuccino. And in the in the back, the partisans would be moving Jews from one train to the other and getting them out. So 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 he was an amazing guy. And then like many of them, I mean, he never told anybody. And he was this fascinating to me because he was this major celebrity. He told his son, and tore, and then whenever there were rumors about it, whenever it came up, he'd always say, "I just, I want to be remembered as a sportsman." You know, if you do something good for people and you talk about it, it kind of ruins it. And uh, he had this great line. He said, uh, you know, some medals they pin to you for winning a bicycle race. There are other medals you get rewarded for um, it later. They're pinned to your soul. Um, so this is quite poetic. So, th I mean, he's an amazing story. But, I mean, there's, I mean, Arena Sendler was 29 years old, going in and out of the Warsaw Ghetto, which is like the worst hell on earth, saving, like, babies. I mean, so, you know, there's... How did you discover his story? I'm just curious. Bartoli? Yeah, because I haven't heard. Um, so uh, 
that um, I heard about, I think through Yad, through going through the archives in Yad Vashem, mm -hmm. I was really interested in people who were in like either celebrity or creative professions. Um, I also have an Olympic rower who was part of the Danish. And so I found his story, and I'm fascinated by Italy anyway. Um, you know, my magazine, I'm going back to Rome, I, I speak Italian. So I was able to do a lot of research about him. I went into the Florentine um, real estate office to prove that he owned this um, apartment. I spoke to his granddaughter. and. Um, and he's just an, just an amazing, I mean, I just, once I heard that story, I was like, this is so amazing. And uh, they actually, um, the, he was um, honored late, right? So it was only probably 10 or 15 years ago. And, um, and he, uh, they did the Giro d'Italia, which is the, the, like the number two race, the Italian equivalent of the Tour de France. The only time the opening stage has ever been held outside of, of of Europe was they did it in Israel in his honor, and they made him an honorary citizen of Israel. And so, um, you know, but it, yeah, it, it's, uh, um, I just stumbled across it as just true for most. I mean, there's one in a circus I also stumbled across. So. And so as you did this deep dive into um, quite a range of stories, I'm wondering if there was any sort of common psychology or outlook or something you ascribe to this group that made them stand out and do these impossible, impossibly good actions? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a really good question. And I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I, I, I talk about it in, in the conclusion. Um, so as, there was one study that was done. You know, I mentioned there, weren't, there wasn't much done. There was one study done um, by psychiatrists. They were a husband and wife. Um, Holocaust survival survivors. They were um, Freudian, so they looked at it in a very specific way. And they found one, the only correlation they could find um, was how you were disciplined as a child by your parents, okay? So if you were disciplined in a like irrational way, violently, that tended to go in the wrong direction. But if you were in a household where you were disciplined in a loving and rational way, that Okay, that, that was what they discovered. I think what I would build on that, which is a few things. Um, the universal trait I found with all the rescue stories I've seen is that there was pretty much everybody had one person, usually a parent, sometimes both parents, or some role model as a child that did a couple of things that first of all taught them that um, you need to respect other people, that you shouldn't be, um, not just like bigoted, because that was obviously part of it, who exposed them to people different than themselves, but also that you, you shouldn't be like mean to people and treat them unfairly. That was very important. And then um, if you think about it, uh, like to be a rescuer, you have to be a little eccentric, like, a, you know, and, and, and you have to have really strong self-esteem because you're doing something that the rest of the world was doing quite the opposite. And, and, and often at danger to yourself. So these were often people who also grew up with a lot, with, they had very strong self-esteem, which was often associated as well with being in a household where you were valued and your interests were valued and you were supported. And so that was one kind of set. That, that was, and, then, and then I looked at, I think there was definitely people who were in um, international professions, so lots of diplomats, people in the shipping business, people in, uh, it, or education, it did not correlate with. I mean, at the Bansi conference, like every Nazi had a PhD, right? But 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 um, but being in a creative profession often helped. Um, and uh, and then you know, generally they were people who believed in something bigger than themselves. Sometimes and it could have been a mix of things. Sometimes it was political. Sometimes it was cultural. Um, the most um, the most common was religion. And so whether it was um, you know. Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, it was, that was the single biggest thing, and it would, but it was people who um, believed in, who had faith and believed in the teachings of the religion, like, profoundly, and which often came from a parent, but who didn't, weren't interested in religion for reasons of, like, external displays of piety and hierarchy, and, and so, like at the village I mentioned with the, you know, um, the pastor and his wife above the temple, they call it a temple, a Protestant, 
it said, you know, it said, love thy neighbor, right? And so it was people who believe that, you know, though that that saved more Jews than than anyone, you know, that um, so so that 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 was definitely a, a commonality. Thank you. Um, so before the discussion, Richard and I were talking about our different type of work and the work I do and the work I did with my ex troop commando book has been really dedicated to telling the st stories of Jews who rescued themselves and, and Jews who served in the military in the United States and in England and were at the front lines of, of rescue. And my work has been focusing on extending our knowledge and our understanding of what Jewish rescue meant to include actually the military, the men who served in the military, Jewish men who served in the United States and in England. Um, because uh, sometimes I, we talked about this, feel a bit of discomfort with the idea that it was sort of these kindly Gentiles who were always saving the Jews. So I asked Richard beforehand, do you have stories of Jewish uh, Jews saving Jews too? Um, and are you comfortable if I ask you about this? So I am asking you about this, if you'll talk about that briefly. Yeah, so I, I it's a really interesting topic and um, I, I, they play a cameo role in my book um, and I talk about it in the introduction, I actually just d decided not to include stories of Jewish rescue because I really was interested in people who rescued people that were very different than themselves, right? Who didn't have any kind of tribal or religious connection to them. Um, so I even, I excerpted an article over the weekend in the Boston Globe about Nicky Winton, who saved, if, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the video of, he was a British banker. When he was 29, he saved like 600, almost 700 children on the kinder transport and never told anyone and years later he was surprised on the BBC and that everyone stood up in the room that he had rescued. And, and it's gone like, it's been seen tens of millions of times. But I didn't write a chapter on him because even though his parents had converted, he was Jewish. And, and, and um, so I just made that decision. But, as a, but there were Jews who were important. So in, um, in the Polish chapter, um, you know, Arena Sendler, um, she had grown up with Jews. Her father was a doctor who treated Jews. Um, he died. He caught typhus when she was seven. And a part of her network, she had a network out of the ghetto and in the ghetto, and all of the, all mostly young women. And the young women in the ghetto were Jewish. And then, of course, you had the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and that's part of it. I mean, what's interesting is you, the opposite of Jewish rescue, you didn't even, there were people who didn't like Jews. Like Oskar Schindler was a member of the Nazi party, right? Um, in Poland, there was a group called Zegota that she worked with, and it was founded by two women. One was the, husband, was the wife of the ambassador to Washington. He, she was a big liberal Democrat. And her partner was this ethno-nationalist Polish writer, very famous, who was a known, very famous anti-Semite. But she made the decision, like, Jews shouldn't be killed, and actually founded this group that rescued tens of thousands of Jews. Um, so, um, you know, in the Varian Fry story, I was talking about Hiram Bingham, a lot of his group there that rescued all those artists and writers at the behest, actually, of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, a, lot, a number of them were Jewish. Um, because, you know, one of them actually um, became a very famous economist, um, uh, uh, um, Albert Hirschman. Anybody who ever does anything in antitrust, there's something called the HHI index. He's the H, one of the Hs. Um, so, he was, so there were Jews, like, around it. Um, and, then, and then there was, uh, I mean, I, I quoted Hannah Shanesh, who was an amazing story of a paratrooper who came, went in, you know, and, and tried to, and she was killed. Um, she had wrote beautiful poems about the rescuers. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the whole, I do talk a little bit, in a, you know, about the whole issue of the United States. And, and part of that is the Jewish community here, and the Jewish community also was not a monolith, so the Orthodox acted, acted differently than others, and... Um, there was um, a pageant that went around. I mean, this was what's amazing is people have this misunderstanding, I think, of how much we knew about the Holocaust. I mean, there was a pageant that went to Madison Square Garden, the Hollywood Bowl. Ben Hecht wrote it. Um, there were a lot of Jewish stars. There was also Frank Sinatra was in it, and, and, and it went around, and they were saying, we've already killed two million Jews. And, and like every people knew what was going on. It's, not, it's like a fallacy to say that they, that they didn't. But, um, I've had this debate with Abe Foxman, you know, from the, who's a friend of mine, um, about, you know, he's a big proponent of honoring Jewish rescue, and I, I am too, but I just, that, that, that wasn't what the, uh, yep, I took leave stuff out, and that was one, unfortunately, one thing. No, and I'm actually so grateful you wrote this book, too, because we need all these stories, and the, the thing that 
I'm hearing from you is, first of all, how extraordinary these people were, but how rare they were. So how do you understand the fact that um, there were so few people doing this? Well, <laughs> I think there's not, I mean, it, 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 there's a few reasons. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the big, biggest thing is we can't, like a lot of people kind of ag agreed with it at, at its base. A lot of people were very opportunistic, so you were able to, to take advantage of, of people being persecuted and get their house or turn them in for small amounts of money. I think a lot of people were really scared to do anything um, because they would kill you or put you in jail. And in parts of Europe, like in Poland, I mean, it's easy for us to judge, but you know, in Poland, they would kill not only you, but your family. So I think most of us, people think, like to think they would have acted like the rescuers. I think very few of us would have. And the point of my book is not, I mean, I find, the, I think these are amongst the most heroic people in the history of the world. I mean, this was the, probably the nadir of human history, and these people stood out, and it was incredible what they did. Um, what I'm, I'm also interested in is community rescue. I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago about this because, you know, the question is not everyone is ever going to do this because, you know, you have, I mean, again, people risk their lives for people often that were strangers or they didn't even know. And so there's a, I think there are a couple lessons that we can learn that are actually, you know, more realistic, like more applicable maybe even to also our society because I don't think we're anywhere near something like the Holocaust, which is on the one hand, there, there was a rescuer, so one of these guys in Holland. And he said, and which had a mixed record, right? But he said it was more successful than in other places. And he said, you know, we were the tip of the spear. And the reason that we were effective was because, you know, wh while we were doing what we were doing, everybody else kind of went along with it, looked the other way. And if you were in a country where people were quietly sympathetic, they maybe weren't willing to risk their own life, but they were certainly weren't going to, like, turn on someone who was. The rescue was much more successful than in most parts of Europe where people ran to turn people in to get a reward or, or out of spite. Um, and so, so, so I think so that's important because that's, create, that's why I, mean, I think this, you know, people make fun of the anti-bullying campaign and all of that, but I think it's actually quite important. It's really important for children because, you know, A, to stand up for somebody, um, and then also if the majority agrees with you, then you create a culture where you know the bigotry is sort of in the in in the minority, and, and the other thing that I think is important to understand is, the twenty eight thousand people recognized as righteous among the nations. Very very strict criterion. Actually, none of your, no one Jewish can be recognized, even if you were in the Warsaw ghetto fighting. You know, okay, but um, I think the number. I think our Yad Vashem personally is too strict, right? Primo Levi in his memoir of Auschwitz, wrote about, before he'd been deported to Auschwitz, he was in Italy in an internment camp, and this, woman, this laborer named Lorenzo brought him soup every day. And he talked about it, and he said, that man kept me alive, because he showed me he cared, and he made me feel like I was still a person. And there, you, when you go through testimony, you hear this all the time. So it could have been you know, letting someone stay over for the night. Um, like, you see somebody on the run, and like, you know, a smile. Like, these little gestures actually made a huge difference. And they, they're things we can do every day to somebody. You don't know how, what's going on in someone's life. And so if you, you know, treat them nicely, like, you could be having a major impact on them. And that's also, I think, how you build the kind of, uh, you know, the, the foundation of a society where something like the Holocaust or even something close to it would never happen. And it's important to do that because a, our society, as you mentioned, we're having a lot of problems with hate right now, and then there have been 40 genocides since World War II, so like, we, you know, never again is a rings hollow. Um, so, um, so I think like, you know, I think the 20, like, you know, it still was rare, but you should multiply by 100 or whatever, it's still, you're still gonna get one out of 200 or whatever, but, but, I, but those little gestures where you weren't risking your life, but you were, you were you were you were sympathetic, or you gave people the the courage to keep going, or you gave them food or something like that. Though that that was really important, also. And I'm I'm really glad you mentioned Primo Levi's um, survival in Auschwitz. Every year I teach it to Hunter students, and if people are looking for sort of the I think the most compelling and beautiful and important 
Holocaust memoir and Lorenzo, um, you should read Survival in Auschwitz. It just hits everything we're talking about uh, here. And, and Primo Levi was a brilliant and beautiful writer as well. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with a couple more questions, and then we'll open it to the audience after that. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the journey of writing this book, how it how it changed you, and also any surprise, deep surprises you found when you were writing it. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, I it, it, it in it was a difficult. Parts of it were really hard to write. I mean, the chapter on Poland was really difficult because, you know, that really was the worst of the worst of the worst. The Warsaw Ghetto, the um, you know, the uh, the six death camps. Um, Arena Sendler talked about scenes in it of, that were like Dante and children and all of that. So, and and so that was really difficult. But I think I come out of the book more uh, optimistic about humanity than before having gone through because you see you know um that both both the writing of the book but also the reaction to it i think at least in this country but also in a lot of places i think people want to be if they want to be like these people and if they're not going to be like them they want to celebrate them and i think but we have like a problem in our culture that we don't honor people like this. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't say like, you know, it's great that LeBron, like I'm not saying don't celebrate LeBron James or somebody like that for like other stuff because that's important too and part of the culture, but like very rarely do you turn on the TV set and they go, oh, we're giving like the, you know, this award to this person who who, who rescued, you know, people. It's so, so it's rare and, and it, you know, and it like, it happens after 9-11, they applaud the first responders and then it stops, right? And so, um, so, uh, so that's one, and then I, you know, so so it, it in, you know inspired me in sort of also the capacity of people, people to do good. Um, but I also am like it definitely has made me more like I have another book I'm going to write about my cousin who was a prosecutor at Nuremberg, and I'm probably going to take a break from the Holocaust because it's really dark. And um, you know, one of the things I actually hope from this book is it's really important to think about. How do you tell the story of the Holocaust to people? Like, I mean, I myself, so my family wasn't affected um, by it. My wife, my mother-in-law is a Holocaust survivor. And, um, but when I went to see the Holocaust Museum, and I'm Jewish, right, like I found it difficult, and I was uh, you know, in my 20s. So how do you talk to people without starting them off with Primo Levi or Elie Wiesel? And you know, I mean, I read Elie Wiesel in eighth grade, and it was very traumatic. And I think rescue stories are a great way of doing it because children need to understand this. But you know, like my daughter read a book called *Number of the Stars* about the Danish rescue, and you know, it's about how they say. But then the background, you say, well, why are they being saved? It's because something terrible is going on, right? And then you start to be able to explain it to people because for a lot of people to understand the Holocaust, like they just shut down. So I have a friend who's. A, documentary filmmaker and um, about the Holocaust, and he has a great metaphor. He said it's sort of like a banister you can hold on to, right? So I also, another thing I've thought a lot about is that the, I think these stories, it, it's actually the opposite of what people were concerned about distorting the record. I think they're actually really important gateways to start to un then explain the magnitude of what, of what happened, because you need some positive or you need some light to hold on to Right? Like Martin Luther King said, I quoted it, he said, um, darkness can't drive out darkness, only light can do that. But we need to know that you still have to teach the darkness, but I think the, like the stor these stories are, are, are one way, it's not the only way, um, but it's an, you know, I think it's a, it's a helpful way, particularly with children of, 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 of Holocaust education and also trying to you know, inspire goodness in people. And it's something we always struggle with at Hunter, which is how do we teach this? We just had a group of students um, through our Eva Cooper Fund who just went to DC. We had like this competition for a bunch of students to do um, a series of extracurricular classes on combating anti-Semitism. And then we, 
they just got back from going to DC and going to the Holocaust Museum, a bunch of the Hunter students, and the teachers in the program are always struggling with what you said, so um, we will need to get your book for our students so that they have this, no, I'm serious, because we, have, <laughs> we haven't, we have found yeah. it a very hard balance on how we do this, um, particularly with students who have no background as well, so thank you. Um, and we're gonna open up for questions and then I'll ask more questions after. First. Thank you. There's a micro, the, um, there'll be a microphone brought to you. Hi, you were talking about how few um, relatively uh, people who, who hid the Jews. Here, what here, here, here. You were talking about, <laughs> you were talking about how few um, uh, the number of people who hid the Jews. What about all of the people who hit, were hiding the Jews and got killed? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, that's a very good point. I talked about that a little in the book. Yeah, I mean, you, that we'll never know. Right, I, I, again, I think the 29,000 is an understatement, um, even for people who obviously did risk their lives, right? And, and, and Yad Vashem is tough about this, I think. Like, um, so I think you, it, it's, it's higher than that, obviously, but it's still out of 500 million. But yeah, there were many people who had failed rescues and they were killed or the people they tried to rescue were killed. And there are also people who, you know, did this and never told, and we don't know that they did it and nobody ever came forward. Yes, I uh, just read a uh, story in Smithsonian about a Muriel Gardner. Does that ring a bell to you? She was in Austria. She was an American. Yeah, Muriel I, Gardner. I, I saw the. I haven't. I've read the art. I saw the art article. It was sent about the heiress, right? Who, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. I recommend it. I believe it's the February uh, issue of Smithsonian. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mac. There's someone in the tent in the front here. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I have a few things, um, but I'll try to condense it. Um, have you seen uh, the movie about the White Rose, the German film? Yeah. Yeah, the it Verhoeven really is movie? a great, for you, uh, you might want to get, I'll give you a few film, I write about film, so I'm going to give you some suggestions. But there was uh, also, uh, there was a, a documentary called Four Winters, and it's about the Jews who escaped into the woods uh, in Eastern Europe and then formed a, their own, uh, underground to fight. And uh, that is another aspect that I think, you know, you, you mentioned about the Jewish, there was a, also, there's a film about Jews who were sent to Germany as spies because they could speak perfect German and they went there to, uh, get, it, uh, to get information. And I think there's a lot of this, like you said, uh, that uh, is not being accounted for, that should be accounted for. And I don't know what effort is being made to look at this larger, more global picture, uh, about it. In fact, uh, Hannah Sen is it Hannah Sencha? Yes, yeah, Senich. Yeah, that's it. There's a great documentary about her that's yeah. also worth checking out. And I think that um, I think you're right. I don't know if there's a guide though that brings all this material together. But if there is, there should be one. And can I just say something on that? Um, so I had thought my book after my extra book would be about uh, Jewish partisan women who were in woods and did this stuff and. And I'm sure Richard will understand this too. As historians, you get these topics, and then the horror of the Holocaust is you, you have a great topic, but there's no information left on. Yeah. You see a name mentioned, or and there was not enough. Arc, there's not enough material on many of the most important rescue stories that we need to sure. write them. We hear names, but but then how do you? Yeah. So it's. Um, Leah, may I share a question? Because also from someone a lot of it, us? some of it was clandestine work as well. Yeah, you know, so yeah. That people didn't keep records. Uh, Mac Leah, has a question. May I share a question from someone joining us online? Sure. sure. There are 100 people, 180 people on Zoom, and one of them, Tina uh, Jezik, asks, "How can we find more information than what is shared on the Yad Vashem database regarding a righteous ancestor? We have his file number and a short summary of his rescue." Um, I mean, I'm happy. I'm always happy for people to email me if I can be helpful and use my my skills on that. Um, the, the Yad Vashem file, they're not the files aren't on the website, so you have to. If you have the file number, you should be able to contact 
Yad Vashem and get the full file, um, which probably will have a lot more, more information. When I went to the church for Sisi in Italy, um, between the upper chamber and the lower chamber of the church, it's hollow. I mean, probably aware of this. And that's where they hid the Jews. But what I was unable to find out is who did it? Who in the group or what organization was responsible for hiding the Jews in that particular church? Which church was this? It's easy in uh, okay. Italy. So I, I, that was probably um, the bishop um, but, uh, and his uh, secretary uh, was one of the people that was sort of um, in charge of the rescue effort in Assisi. Another was the um, the father um, at one of the um, monasteries. But it was really everyone. Um, so you know, there was a, a mother superior that allowed Jews and partisans, including men, to go into the cloisters. The Nazis knew it. They were trying to get she would stand up to them. You had counterfeiters working all over town who were not you know, part of the clergy, um, but it was really a group, a group effort, and it was in many, many buildings in all over Assisi. Yeah. So, so who in the, uh, the 28,000 people, how were they accounted for? The Assisi, in Assisi? Um, I don't know exactly how many, I mean, Barclay's been honored. Um, the most, the, the, the people I just mentioned have all been honored. Um, the Cardinal of Florence has been honored. I mean, there's probably, you know, 30 or 40 people that were honored. Um, and part of it is, like, in order to be honored, you need to, someone needs to want to do it, which I always encourage people when they say, like, you know, that their relative did it, they should get it done, or if they were rescued, they should make sure the person who, because it has, it doesn't, like, Yad Vashem doesn't run around looking for people uh, to, to honor. I mean, the, there was an organization called De La Sem, which was Jewish, that was a refugee organization that was dealing mostly with refugees coming into Italy from outside. And it was mostly supported by donations from the American Jewish community. And the, Mussolini loved it because he took a commission. <laughs> and it dealt with the refugee crisis. But then, you know, people don't, you know, the church is complicated. But actually, the large parts of the church had really good relationships with the Jewish community in Italy. And when the Jews had to go underground after 1943, the church took over the operation that was being run by the by the Jews, and that was the original like core of it, and it, that started in Geneva. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to thank you for mentioning Sousa Mendez. Um, I get regular communications from the foundation, and Sousa Mendez. Ha I want to recommend it to everybody. It's Mendez with an S, not a Z. Um, the foundation has been extraordinarily active in. Um, promoting uh, stories of people who one doesn't hear about, uh, uh, Albanians and Portuguese and uh, people in, the, in North Africa who were very active in saving Jews. Um, so I, I wanted to um, underscore that. I also wanted to ask you whether the book covers Sugihara Chiune. Yes. Uh, it does, good. Yes. I, I'm um, delighted to hear that. So it, it it does. Um, so I agree with you about the Susan Mendes Foundation, and they've been very supportive of my project. And I use their archive, and I just did an event, uh, like a webinar, with them, and they do great, great programming. And as I mentioned, Su Susan Mendes is, was called by the Christian Science Monitor, I think, like the breakout star of the book. So he, he's he's an amazing, amazing person. Um, yeah, Sugahara is a, he's he's he's, in, he's chapter five. Um, and uh, his, for the, those of you who don't know, he was a um, Japanese, um, well, they, they called him a diplomat, but he was uh, fluent in Russian and spent a lot of time in Manchuria and Harbin, which is where there were Jews and Chinese and a lot of Russians. And he was sent to um, Lithuania to open up a consulate in a town called Kovno, where there were no Japanese people ever. So why do you do that? Because you're a spy. And the, uh, the Japanese um, were convinced, rightfully, that the uh, Russians and the Germans would end up uh, at war with each other. And he was sent there to monitor troop movements. And while he was there, um, huge amounts of Jews from Poland and then you know, elsewhere lined up in front of his consulate. And um, 
he could give them a transit visa. He actually also arranged, um, pretty sure, um, for transit through Russia, the Trans-Siberian um, Railway. And so he saved about 5,000 um, people. I've had a, he, of all of the people in the book, has had the strangest experience. It's a powerful experience. Um, I, um, I have had um, f not just, whenever I write one of these stories or now when the book came out, people will email me and say I'm alive because of this person saved my grandfather, whatever. Sugahara, there are um, five, maybe six people I know personally that he saved that are alive because of him that I had no idea about that. The other thing about his story, which was interesting, I uncovered, um, there was another not real diplomat. He was a businessman. He was in charge of the Philips, um, electro Philips radio at the time um, office in, in Kovno. And um, uh, his name is um, Jan Schwarzendijk. He was Dutch. And um, I uh, actually interviewed his son, who was, became the CEO of a large um, uh, supermarket, Royal Ahold, which owns Stop and Shop, I think. And um, he, uh, they figured out that um, you, know, you needed all these papers. And that was like the tragedy of a lot of rescue with diplomats is you, people would need like three visas. You need an exit visa. You need an entry visa. You need a transit visa. And sometimes people would get all three, and the first one would be expired. And most consulates would slam the door in your face. And there, they, this guy was, you know, he and his superior agreed that in Curacao, you didn't need a, um, a visa to get there. It was up to the local governor to let you out. And so a number of like kind of clever um, young Jewish people convinced them to write a, something that left out the fact that about the governor and just said no visa required for Curacao. And he issued thousands, thousands of these. And then they, a lot of people went over to the Japanese consulate to Sugahara and said, OK, I can go to Curacao. Can I go through? And he, of course, wrote. And there's stories of Sugahara because a Japanese vi um, uh, visa is like almost this calligraphy. It has to be done in almost calligraphy. And his, he worked 18 hours a day until they finally shut his consulate down. He was exhausted. And then he went to the ho ho he put up a sign and said, meet me at this hotel. And he continued to write visas for two days. And then on the, even on the train, he was still writing visas on the platform. And then he threw the paper off. And some people used it. And he said, like, whatever you, you can do. And he also had a, he, he was fired, um, went door to door selling light bulbs at one point. To, but at the end of his life, the people found him, some of the people that he had um, rescued. And he was honored. Um, Schwarzendijk, um, was reprimanded. He was a business guy, but he was reprimanded by the foreign ministry for what he did they, and then in Holland. Um, and then years later uh, in Los Angeles, somebody, they, people didn't know his name. They thought his name was Philip Radia because it was Philip's radio. And, and um, <laughs> somebody found him. And there were a couple people that thanked him, but he, late, like, his, he didn't really, he was a little disillusioned. His son, one of his sons like, was very interested in it and found out. And there's a small Jewish community in Kobe. And it turned out he saved like over 2,000 people. And the list of the people that he, he uh, survived, like, saved arrived two days after he died. Um, but he had known that he, like at the end of his life also. But um, yeah, the Sugahara um, is an amazing, an amazing story. And again, like, he, he um, was an unusual guy. I mean, he'd spent a lot of his time outside of Japan. He had converted to Orthodox. He was fluent in Russian. Um, and um, and he just felt, but he found himself in the circumstance and, you know, had a moment, didn't know what to do. And then he just, and he also had this like kindness to him. Um, he would serve people tea while they, because it was this huge lineup and, 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 and the, he had people go out and say, don't worry. The consul's going to take care of you. He saw a pregnant woman online, and he said to her, go, go home, and I'll have the visa for you tomorrow. Please don't, don't, don't like stand in the cold. And you know, and there, I actually have a friend whose aunt was rescued by him. And in her testimony, she talked about her and her sister were like 18, like in hysterics. And they were like bowing down to him and kissing his, like almost kissing his feet. And he was like, no, 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 don't. It's okay. he, she, they described him basically doing this, like, it's not a big deal. And he meant that. Right, um, and his wife later said that they viewed it, even though it really, they paid a heavy price for it. They said that they, they were very um, grateful that they had the opportunity to do the rescue. 
Thank you. Um, so we have time for one last question. So there's a gentleman right. Yeah, uh, of course, we commend you for your work. Uh, it Thanks. seems like the line that's running through the discussion, we haven't seen the book yet, I haven't seen the book yet, is culture. But when these issues arise, what is much more pressing for me is nature, human nature, animal nature, especially the nature of the male of the species, Homo sapiens. I realize this is not your uh, issue to deal with in the book. But my reaction is we must get to our nature as species to even begin to start to understand how terrible things like this happen. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, that's, uh, there's a dark side. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, some people, have, I've, this also goes to kind of religious questions and issues of free will and all of that, right? And, and unfortunately, you know, it showed there was a moment in time at least where more, many, many more people were giving in to the worst possible instincts that people have and the worst part of human nature. But I think we've come, I actually am, think we've, despite everything going on, we're in a better place now than we certainly were in 1940. So we're going to meet in the reception room um, and um, our author will sign books. And thank you, Daniel, again for doing our reception. Thank you, thank Richard. You. So thank you. Thank you.